Hi, welcome to More Christ. This is a channel dedicated to Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox alike. Today I'm joined by William T. Kavanagh. William T. Kavanagh is an American theologian known for his work in political theology and Christian ethics. He's published numerous books and articles, some of which have been translated into several languages. William's also an editor of the journal Modern Theology. So just to begin, Bill, um, can you tell us a bit about your background and some of the key currents in your life that have helped to form your character and things that, that have moved you maybe to write about Christ and his church so much? Sure. Um, I was raised in a Catholic family uh, of the type where um, Catholicism was so important that we never talked about it. And we just <laughs> showed up for mass on Sunday and then uh, went and got donuts afterwards. Um, and my parents both kind of come out of that immigrant American experience. So my mom from kind of immigrant German Catholic farmers and my dad um, from the city uh, of Irish and Polish uh, immigrants and out of that kind of immigrant church where uh, the church was your whole social life. Um, but then we moved out to the suburbs and, you know, we, we were at mass every Sunday. Um, but really didn't do anything else and, and never kind of talked about it. And so um, just a, a combination of sort of uh, piety and, and wondering what it's all about kind of led me towards uh, being a theology major in college. I actually started out as a chemical engineering major and then got hooked on theology and uh, ran into Stanley Hauerwas um, uh, as an undergrad at Notre Dame. Uh, Stanley Hauerwas, the kind of famous uh, Methodist theologian who was named uh, <clears throat> Time Magazine's best theologian or something like that in the year 2001. Um, a, a kind of ornery Texan who swears a lot and um, shakes things up. And, uh, and his kind of major question was really like, what difference does it make to be Christian? Uh, in the world and kind of talked about how the church has been co-opted uh, and assimilated in many ways into American culture. And so um, he was a pacifist and, and kind of a contrarian. And so it made me think a lot about what difference does it make uh, to be a uh, Christian. And he, he talks about um, the church as a, a kind of different sort of organization than um, the nation state and the market and so on um, meant to be distinctive and meant to follow Christ um, and bring that into all areas of life, not just on Sundays. Um, so I kind of went after uh, undergrad, went to, um, into a, a volunteer program and then eventually down to Chile. Um, kind of looking for this church that Harawas was talking about, and in some ways sort of found it. I lived in, uh, in a poor area of Santiago, Chile, under the military dictatorship uh, in the late 1980s, and worked for the church there on a cooperative building project. And, um, and at the time, the church was kind of the major uh, resistance to the military regime. And so um, in some ways that was kind of an experience of the sort of immediate uh, uh, social political relevance uh, of the church in a way that was kind of defending human rights. And, um, and that then became the basis for my uh, dissertation and first book, which is Torture and Eucharist. Uh, um, so the, the church's response to human rights abuses under the military regime. Uh, in Chile, um, torture and Eucharist. Uh, I have a priest friend who says those are the two two principal parts of the mass. First, you get the sermon, which is torture, and then you get the Eucharist. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, that sounds too familiar. <laughs> so um, you mentioned Harawas there. I had the pleasure of interviewing Harawas even for this channel too. I want to ask you, are there any other persons that who, whether that's in academia or your personal life, have been especially inspirational or influential for you? And um, what really has moved you about those persons? Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of people on the personal level, I guess, that I've met who are kind of, you know, walking the walk. Um, it, of the kind of famous people, I would say Dorothy Day 
um, is probably the, the biggest inspiration. Um, you know, someone who, who in the Catholic world was really um, uh, instrumental in creating these kinds of alternative communities where people really try to follow the gospel, um, uh, taking care of the poor, protesting against violence, uh, renouncing the weapons of war and so on. Um, and, uh, and all from a place of kind of deep, um, deep faith uh, in Christ and, and this kind of deep vision of the body of Christ um, in, in, in all of the senses, in the Eucharist, in the church, uh, in the faces of the poor. You know, um, a great story about Dorothy Day. Um, we had Jim Forrest, who was one of her friends, come and talk, and he told a story about someone who came in and um, donated a big fat diamond ring. And uh, Dorothy turned around and gave it to a homeless woman. And the other people that were working there said, what are you crazy? You know, we could have paid six months rent with that if we'd sold it. And her response was, well, do you think God only made diamonds for rich people? Uh, and that kind of approach to kind of seeing the dignity of each person and seeing Christ, uh, see, seeing each person as Christ, um, I think it was a really um, influential thing. And then I've got lots of other kind of um, uh, academic uh, influences. Henri de la Bach, I suppose, would be one of the one of the primary ones. Yeah, marvelous. Um, thank you. I think uh, this comes across too in your written work, which I'd love to speak with you about. So um, if we might, I'd love to start with your most recent book, Field Hospital, The Church's Engagement with the Wounded World. So in a 2013 interview, Pope Francis famously likened the church to a field hospital, saying that um, this, his vision of the ideal church is one that attends to the overwhelming suffering of the world before concerning itself with smaller matters. So in this book, you seem to adopt Pope Francis's metaphor to show us how the church can help heal both the spiritual and the material wounds of the world. Can you speak into what you're saying there? How do you then, um, via this theological vision, understand the challenges of um, religious practice and even freedom today, especially, I think, related to things like COVID-19 and the increased power in the hands of the state and in large co corporations? Yeah, I suppose, I mean, part of what was interesting about that metaphor to me is that it's not just a hospital that attends to people's wounds, uh, both spiritual and um, physical. Um, that's important. Um, but it was a field hospital, which is particularly interesting. So instead of being this kind of large immobile institution, a regular hospital that people have to come to, um, it's, uh, it's a more mobile, agile kind of um, reality. So the church more as event than institution um, that kind of goes out to the world and attends to, to people's wounds and doesn't have a certain kind of territory uh, to defend. Um, and that um, seems to me to be um, part of what you're getting at, I think, in your question about this, the state and so on, that when we think about um, the suffering in the world, we tend to think, well, what is, what is the state going to do about it? Um, and we think the only thing we can do is try to elect the right people and lobby uh, the government to, to do something. And um, the ap approach of Pope Francis, I think, um, puts the burden back where it belongs, which is on each of us um, to uh, and, and the church corporatively to sort of go out and, um, and be Christ uh, to other people and not just kind of uh, delegate that responsibility uh, to others. Wendell Berry talks about the way we have a tendency in, in modern life to just delegate um, everything uh, that we're doing to um, large entities and so we you know delegate education to schools and we delegate our food to large corporations and um, and so on uh, and so we've gotten away from this sense that we're capable of doing something uh, uh, on our own and so um, and and in doing so doing it with the kind of full integrity uh, of the gospel 
And so um, that's what Dorothy Day talked about as personalism. And I think it's, it, it might uh, in some ways be behind what John Paul II meant by personalism as well. Um, but the idea that um, you attend to people as they are on a kind of personal one-to-one -one basis rather than kind of feeding them into a bureaucracy that were meant to treat, treat each person uh, as if they were Christ, uh, you know, as in uh, Matthew 25. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And um, what then about, say, economic injustices and how does this model of engagement contrast with them? Um, number one, older church models, we might say, and also, as you hinted at there, with secularist models, which might tend to the state or large corporations as their first port of call. I was staying with um, my godparents years ago and came upon an old Catholic school geography textbook in uh, their spare bedroom that one of their kids had used in the 1950s. It was 1952 and it was called World Neighbors. And um, it had all of these incredible uh, things about economic practices that Catholic communities around the world were actually engaging in. So it had this um, portrayal of Westphalia, Iowa, this little town in Iowa where the priest and the people had um, all kinds of cooperatives, uh, a cooperative garage and a cooperative grocery and a cooperative um, credit union and all of these different kinds of economic practices. Um, and it was interesting to me because I had grown up uh, in and gone to Catholic school. And what we had there for our geography textbooks were the same geography textbooks that everybody else was using. And so there's this assumption that economics is economics. And um, and there's no kind of particular Christian way of approaching uh, economics. Whereas this kind of older model, um, which had its own limitations, of course, I don't think I would have wanted to grow up in Westphalia, Iowa in, in 1950s, I'm sure, <laughs> you know, the, the people, I actually went and interviewed some of the people there and they said, you know, you, you had to ask the priest permission to go on a date. And, you know, there's all kinds of the, those sorts of limitations, but the idea that um, there's a there's a separate sort of um, uh, and much more interesting Christian way of going about economics and kind of creating these alternative economic spaces uh, is something that I think in a lot of ways we've lost and and maybe um, in a small way are recovering through kind of fair trade uh, movements and farmers markets and things like that. Um, now, Westphalia, Iowa, um, everybody shops at the Walmart, um, which is, you know, 15 miles away. And, and all of that kind of sense of community and um, social justice and, and different economic practices uh, have, have kind of gone. And so part of what I'm uh, advocating for is this idea that we don't just sort of delegate um, economic practices to large corporations, but that we take, um, take that back into our own hands and try to make, um, make truly free markets and not just um, kind of, um, you know, parody the, you know, the usual kind of ideological um, idea of the free market, which basically means that corporations get to do whatever they want um and and that's not that's not really free does that answer your question i've yeah, kind of good. gone a little bit of field you know that's good thank you bill um i want to ask you something next about this link to my concerns as an irish person especially so how should the pilgrim church acknowledge its share in the guilt of human sin without effacing itself so much that it becomes afraid to act or allowing its um, enemies, for lack of a better word, to question its authority to act in the public square as they uh, claim it is. And um, I think I'll just draw on what seems to be happening in Ireland. So in Ireland, because of the dreadful misdeeds and institutional abuse and everything, um, people have turned very much against the church, which is understandable. But I think for a it seems to me almost that the, the state has used the church 
as a kind of scapegoat and it refuses to acknowledge its um, complicity in this awful abuse and everything. And um, I wonder if you want to take that from maybe the American context or around the world, if you want to. Yeah, that's really an interesting uh, question. You know, um, my mentor, Stanley Harawas, made his uh, reputation in some ways by talking a lot about the church, um, that we need to be not just individual Christians, but we need to be Christians together in a way that makes us stand out from the rest of the world, so that we actually live out the gospel um, in, in a kind of communal uh, way. And that, of course, runs into difficulties when the church is corrupt, right? Um, and, and that's what he's been criticized a, a lot for. You know, he wrote an essay one time about a trip to Ireland where um, they were staying in a little town called Sneem. And he talks about, this was probably in the 1980s, maybe, um, where he, he talks about watching the, um, uh, I think it was a first communion uh, celebration and the, the entire town was involved and people were kind of parading in the town square and into the church and so on. And he thought, if this is Constantinianism, then I like it. <laughs> right? um, he's been a critic of Constantinianism and, you know, the, the kind of um, too close uh, identification of the church with the surrounding culture. But he thought this, this was something really um, kind of worth cherishing. The problem, of course, then is that, you know, this is 20 years before the Ryan report comes out and exposes all of the evils of that kind of church, which is so tightly tied to the culture that then um, there's all sorts of abuses uh, of power um, there. So, um, yeah, so the question is then, how do you not throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Um, how do you um, talk about church when just the very word in, in some ways just, uh, it, it, you know, conjures up images of uh, abuse and, and neglect and abuse of power and so on. Um, uh, I mean, part of the Part of what needs to be done, I think, is um, being clear about what we mean when we talk about church, that um, we're not talking about the bishops, we're talking about us, right? Um, that the church is all of us um, acting uh, together uh, in a communal way. And, and that's a really important um, thing. It's the body of Christ, uh, which is a wounded body um, but we're not just talking about the institution, um, the hierarchical structures of the institution, the clericalism, which continues to be at the heart of all of, all of the abuse, I think, um, uh, that, that we you know, are, are clear about uh, critiquing that and clear about talking about the church as, as, as us, as the body of Christ, as the trying to kind of recognize the body of Christ. And if you look at what Paul says, you know, in 1 Corinthians 12 about um, the care for, uh, of the members for one another and treating the member, um, the weakest members with the greatest honor and how when one suffers, all suffer together and when one rejoices, all rejoice together this kind of sense that we're all part of the same nervous system. That seems to me to be um, uh, essential. That, that's not something that we can do uh, without. And that's not something that you can delegate to a state uh, bureaucracy. Um, so that's, that's what I mean when I talk about the church. And, and, and of course, we have to be always reforming and always um, doing everything we do in a way that's penitential, uh, really. That's something that the Irish ought to be very good about, um, is being penitential, right? Uh, that's the stereotype anyway. But, um, um, but all of us, of course, need to, to do that. I've actually got a, a chapter of one of my books where I talk about the sinfulness uh, of the church um, as being 
uh, a way of being the body of Christ, that, that Christ is the whole drama of sin and redemption, and we're not um, uh, free from that uh, at all. But part of what it means to talk about the church as the body of Christ is that, um, uh, you know, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, that Christ became sin uh, for our sake. And that's um, part of what it means to be part of the church is, is um, being always kind of um, uh, reforming and re re repenting uh, of that sin. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Bill. And um, then you mentioned Dorothy Day and a few people there. Are there any positive examples uh, that have incarnated what you're speaking about, the, the ideal more that you, you've been particularly moved by and that might provide us with inspiration in this 21st century? Um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of um, interesting things going on. Um, I run a center for the um, church in the global south. It's called the Center for World Catholicism, Intercultural Theology, and I'm constantly inspired by what's going on uh, in places like Africa and Latin America and Asia and so on. Um, but also, you know, in the United States, I mean, you've got some, of course, very dramatic kinds of um, uh, interventions, places like the Congo, where um, the church is a very strong voice for um, human rights and democracy uh, and so on. Um, but you've also got all of these kind of micro projects uh, all around the world where people are not only kind of doing the work of charity, you know, Father Danny Pilario in the in the in his sewing project in the um, I think Payatas is the the name of the garbage dump in Manila where um, a whole colony of people live uh, picking through garbage. But he's kind of started a, a sewing cooperative there um, for people to to kind of um, have employment and uh, in a, a dignified way. Um, and there's all kinds of other, it, it, it doesn't have to be in third world contexts, you know, um, I, I think about the Mondragon Corporation in uh, Spain, which was started by a Basque priest in the 1950s, but it's run cooperatively. It's, it's actually a pretty large corporation. It's over 3 billion euros uh, in sales uh, annually but it's run cooperatively and all of the workers own a stake uh, in it and own a, and, and take part in the kind of governance of it. It, it was kind of a whole attempt uh, to work out the um, you know, Catholic uh, social teaching in an actual business corporation. And it's been really a remarkable uh, success. Um, so there are all kinds of different ways um, where people are resisting the violence of, you know, the state and and non-state actors, and resisting the violence of the the market system um, that preys on preys on the poor. Um, uh, so there's really a lot of a lot of signs of of hope uh, from around the world. We tell the story of abuse. Uh, because we need to, and we, and and that's important uh, to tell the stories of abuse. But um, but we need also to to tell the other kinds of stories that are are so inspirational. Yep. Amen. Thank you, Bill. And um, you've edited a few volumes on political theology. And are, for those who maybe are more used to thinking in secularist terms and having the sacred and the secular, um, what does it mean to understand Christian theology as inherently political? And how does this contrast with our everyman's notion of theology as it's developed? Yeah, um, that's, it's dangerous, I understand, to talk about political theology and the church as political, um, because that sounds like it's just about the last thing we need anymore. Of. <laughs> the, the church has been politicized in a, in a very unhelpful uh, way there and, and made partisan in a very unhelpful way. Uh, and so, um, and that's a lot of, uh, a lot of times that's what people think when they think about um, 
thinking of the church as political. Um, and it's almost the opposite of what I mean when I talk about this. So if you, if you think of the church as political, then you, it helps you to stop thinking that we need to choose one of the two parties if you're in the United States, you know, two, two political parties, uh, you got Coke and Pepsi, and th those are the kind of two choices. Um, and those are the only things that, um, you know, that, that when you think about what we can do, you think, well, you've got to choose one of the two parties or one of the two candidates, and, and that's the extent of our uh, political uh, um, involvement. Um, but if you think of the church as political, then it, it becomes more a matter of day-to-day -day life. It becomes a matter of, of saying a, a pox on both of your houses, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans represent the gospel. Um, and so you take a distance from party politics uh, and you understand politics on a more micro level as just being the day-to-day -day way that we take care of one another. You know, um, and that I think is is like when when Aristotle uh, uses the term politics, what he really means is kind of how um, people are organized and taken care of um, for the common good in in a in a city. A, a polis was a city, right? And so it becomes a matter then of when you think of the church as political or the gospel as political, it means that you're out there um, trying to find solutions, um, first at the local level, but also kind of at a, at a broader level um, to uh, basic issues of justice. How do you combat racism? How do you um, make sure that people are housed and fed and um, uh, the environment is not being destroyed and, um, uh, and, and so on? So that's what I mean. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Um, thank you both. So then um, what are some of the primary resources of the Christian tradition which theologians might draw upon uh, when constructing political theologies and how do they contrast say with Marxism whether new or old or the kind of enlightenment uh, liberal, liberal project and as you say the kind of pretend free market? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so Marx uh, got a lot right. Um, uh, his diagnosis in some ways was, uh, was very perceptive. His cure was disastrous, <laughs> right? Um, so um, Marx is worth reading in a, in a lot of levels. I'm actually doing some writing now on his idea of the fetishism of commodities, how people you know, make fetishes or idols out of material goods, um, which kind of animates, kind of makes these material goods um, into animated beings while the life is being sucked out of actual human beings who, whose lives are destroyed in, in the making of these items. Um, and that's a really kind of biblical insight. You know, you look at uh, the prophet Isaiah and he talks about the way um, people kind of give life to idols that they make with their own hands. Um, and in the meantime, their own lives are being uh, destroyed by, by this. Uh, and, and so uh, lots of really interesting stuff uh, in Marx, just the whole idea that um, uh, the system of capital or some benefit from the labor of others the idea that this is unjust, I, I think, is um, is, is really uh, true. Um, but then, of course, the um, the solution the, uh, is is disastrous. Um, and so, there's something to appreciate uh, about uh, Marx. And then, of course, there's a lot of things uh, uh, to reject. Um, as far as liberalism goes, the kind of classic Enlightenment uh, liberalism. Um, if you understand it as the kind of prioritization of freedom over the good, that so liberal as in free, um, the idea that instead of um, a society concentrating on discerning what's good, you just let everybody um, decide for themselves uh, what's good. Um, 
that, um, I mean, there's a, I think, again, there's something to be appreciated there. There's a real kind of um, uh, Christian impulse to, um, to, to see people as free, um, free beings um, who, who ought to be able to kind of make up, um, who, who should not be coerced towards, uh, towards the good. But the prioritization of the free over the good then oftentimes leads to this um, uh, kind of situation where you've got um, uh, the the one's will, the the freedom of one's will becomes an end in itself, rather than a means towards the discernment of the good, and then you get the kind of situation where um, people say that the um, the market is free when corporations get to do whatever they want um, and and that's not really freedom uh, at all and so i'm kind of looking for um something which is neither marxist nor uh liberal capitalist in those um in in those uh, precise ways and that's what i think um the christian tradition offers a kind of different version of the human person a different version of human history, uh, and that um, can can be a, a resistance to both of those things. Yeah, wonderful. I think something too that really comes across in um, your work is a very perceptive notion. In an article you wrote, um, you mentioned about uh, Weber, Max Weber, and how in progressivism and even in Marxism too, you, you have the disenchantment notion, but it lacks the understanding of re-enchantment and um, how these things become gods again. And um, that I think takes us beyond what Taylor describes. And um, I think your work it works really well alongside René Girard in some ways, actually. Mm. Um, would you like to speak to that a little bit and uh, what, what's missing? in that narrative of a progressive liberalism or Marxism? Yeah, so um, the idea that most people take from Max Weber is that the modern world is disenchanted. Um, he used the word entzauberung, which is um, literally means the kind of unmagicking uh, of the modern world. Um, and that's been translated as disenchantment, the idea that now um, we don't believe in wood sprites and fairies and ghosts and gods and so on, um, that everything has been kind of reduced to merely the merely material and, um, and the, the magic is, is gone. Um, and then some people talk about, no, um, you know, there's been a sort of re-enchantment um, and, 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 you know, and, and people still do believe in, in all kinds of, you know, fantastical things. Um, but I think that's a misreading of Weber himself. You know, he talks about, um, in his essay about science as vocation, he talks about um, how the old gods have come back from their graves and, uh, and have taken the form of impersonal forces. And he, he has this kind of idea, he talks about the iron cage of rationality that we, um, and again, a very biblical insight that we have become slaves to gods of our own making. And, um, and that seems to me to be kind of more, um, uh, more true that we never really were disenchanted. Um, it's just that the holy has migrated from church to state and, and market, and now we bow down before other gods, you know, which are false gods. Um, and so um, that seems to me to be a much more, uh, so I'm, my um, current book project is on idolatry. And the first chapter is on Weber, and the second chapter is on Taylor, and then the third chapter on um, uh, uh, the biblical view of idolatry that what we're really talking about is, is idolatry, that people have always kind of worshiped lots of gods uh, and have this kind of need to worship. And that has not gone away. It's just been transferred to other, uh, other things. 
Yeah, wonderful. And um, I would commend the, your book, The Migraces of the Holy as well, for anyone interested in that before even your new one comes out. And um, what are some of the points of evidence then historically of this um, migration of the holy and um, the move, the transfer of devotion from the church to the nation state? So in um, the myth of the secular that we spoke about whenever we're offline with David Cayley, um, you mentioned things like the Treaty of Westphalia and how um, modern secularism has its kind of origin myths and things like that. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm actually just finishing up my chapter on nationalism for this book on idolatry. Uh, and it's really interesting, the, um, the numbers of people. I mean, so in some ways, Weber's counterpart in the origins of sociology is Emil Durkheim. And Durkheim, um, I think, had a very keen sense of this. I mean, he thought that there were no real gods, that religion was just um, basically self-worship. And uh, I kind of develop a, a, an idea in the book of idolatry as self-worship. And I think um, that's exactly what Durkheim uh, uh, is talking about as well, although he wouldn't call it idolatry because he doesn't believe there is a real God. Um, but the idea that um, what is happening in, in nationalism is just the kind of collective self-worship, the kind of collective narcissism, and it's institutionalized in all kinds of, and ritualized in all kinds of ways that are really parodies of Christian uh, ritual. And this has been pointed out over and over again um, across the, the decades of the 20th century, but all of the different ways in which um, the body of Christ um, is replaced by the flag and you have all of these uh, feast days um, that mimic saints days and um, sacrifice, of course, being one of the most important manifestations of this, the idea of blood sacrifice uh, moving from uh, a kind of from the Eucharist to um, the sacrifice of, uh, of um, soldiers for the, for the nation state and the idea of a fatherland and um, and all of the different ways that that the the, the rituals, the kind of liturgical rituals that surround uh, the way flags are supposed to be um, uh, handled, and processions and relics, you know, there there's uh, of course um, you know they had um, the Liberty Bell was taken from coast to coast by train, and people came to kiss it you know, in the same way that you kiss the cross on Good Friday and so on. So there's there's all of these different ways in which um, uh, this civil religion has been institutionalized. And a, a lot of scholars just sort of see in this the kind of movement from uh, uh, church to nation. And, um, and the nation in some ways becomes both church and God. Um, uh, but, but but this, uh, of course, is a kind of imminent God, a kind of um, narcissistic self-worship. Uh, and and it, that seems to be to, to be really quite clear. Has the failure of the church to be the church in its um, international multicultural uh, identity led to, um, in part, and I guess this centering on expressive individualism and deifying our desires and so forth is that sort of led in some ways perhaps to the new secularist identity say of things like critical theory so um the notion of a the per, the i guess the personal will be in political and then linked to sexual identity so that your desires are seen as who you are and you are seen within a community of people with those same desires rather than um, a, an identity that is centered on the church. Do you think that is a, another version of the same sort of um, thing that you're mentioning there with nationalism and um, things like that? Does that make sense? I think so. Um, yeah, it's not something that I've uh, given a lot of thought to, but um, I think the way the, that you've just laid it out um, is, um, is entirely plausible. 
Um, I mean, part of what's happened with um, all of our identities is that they've become commodified. And so um, the, uh, all of our identities have become a matter of consumer choice in a lot of ways. And that goes right down to you know, who we are and, and everything is kind of reduced to a matter of personal choice. Um, it's, it's just another kind of commodity that you choose. Um, and so um, the basis for the, the self as a, a kind of um, uh, our selfhood as given, um, kind of given as a gift by God um, through the mediation of other people, rather than just through um, the mechanism of individual choice, um, I think is something that we need to be aware of and kind of hold uh, hold on to. Um, I think everybody, everybody on all sides of these issues is talking as if they know more than they do uh, at this point. And I think what's really needed is a little bit more humility um, uh, on, on these kinds of questions. Um, uh, and it comes down to, to very simple um, matters of, um, you know, accommodation uh, at uh, the local level. I mean, I just want to go back a little bit then to the myth of religious violence that you've written about, secular ideology and the roots of modern conflict. So um, this idea that religion is a dangerous tendency to promote violence is part of the conventional wisdom of Western societies and it seems to underlie many of our institutions and our policies resulting in what we might call like a form of secularist privilege. Um, but you challenge this wisdom by ex examining how the twin categories of religion and the secular have been constructed. Can you tell us a bit more about how the category of religion has been constructed in the modern West and, and in colonial contexts? Sure. Um... Yeah, it's a fairly recent uh, development. Um, so in uh, the word religion comes from religio, which was a, a Latin term used in ancient Rome, uh, which did not mean what we mean by religion because it included all kinds of stuff that we would consider to be secular. So Augustine talks about religio um, in uh, the city of God where he says that the normal meaning of the word is a, a relationship of respect between a man and his neighbor, uh, which is not what we mean by religion at all. So it doesn't necessarily involve uh, God or gods. Um, in the middle ages, the religious secular distinction is the distinction between two different kinds of clergy, right? Um, those that belong to a religious order and those that belong to a diocese. So it doesn't mean anything like what we mean by religious and secular. So what we mean by this religious secular divide comes into being in the 16th, 17th uh, centuries um, as a way of marginalizing um, church power from state power, really. Um, and so um, it's a way of saying that what the church is responsible for is this thing called religion which is essentially uh, individual and internal. And the state, uh, which is secular, is responsible for everything else. And so this is a way of kind of settling disputes between um, uh, civil uh, authorities and ecclesiastical authorities, you know, which have been struggling for power in Europe for centuries. And so, um, but it becomes, uh, so that distinction comes about with the creation of the modern uh, nation state. And then, and it happens first in Europe, and then this religious secular divide gets um, uh, transferred to the rest of the world through the process of colonial, colonial colonization, uh, colonialism, right? Uh, and so um, it's found to be really useful in colonial context. Actually, at first, when the European explorers went out, they reported home with remarkable consistency that the natives had no religion at all, um, which is a way of kind of dehumanizing them. Um, but once they were colonized, then this religious secular distinction becomes very handy for kind of taking everything from the local culture and putting it into this category called religion. Um, 
and then you privatize it. So, um, you know, when the British take over India, Hinduism, which is itself means kind of everything it means to be Indian, that becomes a religion. And it's then put into this kind of category so that to be British is to be public and to be Indian is to be private. So it has all of these kinds of, of uh, uses. Um, and so the, the religious secular distinction uh, is a way of kind of dividing the world into, into these two categories um, that is incredibly ideological. Um, and it, it doesn't really have any basis in, in nature. Um, it, it's just a kind of part of Western ideology, which is then imposed on the rest of the world. Um, and so our way of dividing up the world, which basically comes out of a dispute between uh, ecclesiastical authorities and civil authorities in Europe, uh, then kind of gets imposed on the rest of the world. And it has these uh, incredibly distorting uh, um, features then. I want to just speak about another book next, Being Consumed, Economics and Christian Desire. So in that book, you present a very nuanced take on economics. Um, that will challenge readers from all over the political compass again. So um, what sort of pathologies do the uh, modern idolatries create? And um, what are some of the positives then that they have brought about and provide for the church? I guess you've spoken to this a bit already, but um, I think your example of things like Amazon and the magical quality is being most interesting. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the first thing I talk about in that book um, is uh, that there's no such thing as the free market, right? Um, uh, some markets are freer than others, and we need to um, uh, discern when a market is free and when it when it's not. Right. So, um, so there's no point in either blessing or damning the free market as such, because there's no such thing. The, the it's not a free market just because the government doesn't intervene. Um, it's free um, from a Christian point of view. It's free if it's leading to the flourishing of all of the parties involved, um, the workers, the uh, managers, the consumers, the earth, uh, and so on. Um, so a kind of positive conception of freedom as more than just um, you know, the lack of interference by others, but actually kind of contributing to the flourishing and, the, and in that sense, the positive freedom of everybody involved. And so you need to um, look very carefully at every kind of economic transaction and seeing whether people are being uh, freed or enslaved uh, by this. It's not freedom if people are so desperately poor that they feel obliged to take a job making 50 cents an hour uh, and working in these you know, uh, prison-like conditions. Um, it, it, people think that that it's free if they voluntarily choose it, but um, it's not voluntary if they're, you know, if they, you know, taking advantage of somebody else's desperation is not an act of virtue, uh, and it's not something that's free. So, um, so that's that's what I'm arguing there. But then, the the idea of um, uh, the kind of uh, consumer society that makes us forget those kinds of questions um, is really uh, interesting uh, to me. So we think of consumerism as being materialistic and being you know, attached to um, material things. But in, in fact, it's detachment. Um, it's detachment from uh, production and from producers and from products. So we don't make anything. Uh, we don't see the people that make them you know, that are on the other side of the world. And even products are things that we're encouraged to kind of not become attached to because you need to throw them out and buy something new when, it, when something new uh, comes out. And so um, there's this, uh, th th these kind of blindnesses are, are created uh, in this way. So we enter this kind of fantasy world where um, the next product is always just about to fulfill us, although it never actually does. 
And at the same time, we turn this blind eye to how things are actually being produced and what's happening to the earth by their uh, production. And so in some ways, it, it really kind of combines um, the, the iron cage of rationality uh, that Weber talked about in the modern world. You know, you, the Amazon warehouse is incredibly mechanized and rationalized so that, you know, the people with scanners, they scan one item in and then the scanner tells them you've got 14 seconds to go get the next item one aisle over and, and, and people have become kind of robotized and everything is, has gotten efficient and rationalized. So that's at the at, at one end of the, the economic process, it's incredibly rationalized. But on the other end, the end of the consumer, it's incredibly fantastical. It's 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 fantasized. It's it's this magical world. Um, and so you've got both of those kinds. You've got the iron cage on the one hand, and you've got enchantment on the other, where all you do is click, and then this product magically appears on your doorstep uh, a couple days later and you never see how it was made or where it comes from or anything and you live this life you know we we, we live in these two-dimensional worlds of these images that pass before our eyes and they're going to make us happy and we click on something and then it kind of magically appears and so these are the, the kind of two sides, both of which are, are, are necessary. Uh, the, both the rationalization and the fantasy are, are necessary to, to the, the current system. Um, and both of them are, are incredibly, I think, destructive of, um, of human life and other kinds of life on, on our planet. Yep, thank you for that, Bill. And um, sort of tied to that, then, what are some of the points for and against um, globalization for Christians? Then, um, yeah, I guess it depends what you mean by globalization. But yeah. um, if um, if what you mean is we ha are more aware of people on in other parts of the world. Um, and more uh, easily in touch with people from other parts of the world, um, then it's a good thing. It's, a, uh, it, it's in some ways the, um, the realization of, the, of Catholicism in the original sense of the word, right? The idea that um, the church is international, um, is global, and um, all of everybody on earth is, is our God's uh, children. Um, if what you mean by globalization is um, the fact that factories can move, but workers can't, um, capital is free to move across borders and boundaries, um, but labor uh, is not, then it becomes a pernicious thing, right? So you move your factory from Massachusetts to Nogal, you know, to just across the border in Mexico, so that instead of paying people a living wage, you can pay them a dollar an hour. Um, and so that's a, a case in which capital is free to move, but but the border ensures that be, the border between the United States and Mexico ensures that um, that the laborers can't, you know, um, if, if that's what you mean by globalization, then um, then it's, it is what Pope Francis says it is. It's basically the freedom of the powerful to move wherever they want uh, in order to better exploit uh, uh, vulnerable people and a uh, vulnerable planet. Thank you, Will. And um, what role then does scarcity play? And um, how are Christians called to live in a world of scarcity? And um, I guess this obviously co contrasts remarkably with our notion, fa fantastical notions that you're talking about as if there's an endless supply of things with no cost. And um, as you mentioned, Wendell Berry and people like that speak about the same sort of things. Yeah, I mean, scarcity is one of those um, terms. It, it gets used to define economics. Classically, economics is defined as 
um, the study of the movement of goods under circumstances of scarcity, right? Um, and, and scarcity is a reality, um, not just because the, the resources of the earth are finite, but according to kind of classical economic theory, scarcity is a reality because humans' desires are infinite. Right, we're always going to want more, and so there's never going to be enough. Um, and so, um, to talk about God as a God of abundance, then, is a way of trying to kind of resist that idea that um, we live in this scarce world where it's dog eat dog, and we are in essentially in competition with one another rather than cooperation with one another. So, Paul's image of the body of Christ, again, is one in which we all, when one suffers, all suffer together. When one rejoices, all rejoice together. Uh, and that means then that um, there is no kind of fundamental uh, commitment to the idea of scarcity, because there's always, if, if, we, if we share what we have and we are children of a good God, then there's always uh, enough. Yeah, and um, I think too, so you mentioned the Catholic kind of universal element there. Something that also comes across in your work is the fullness, the Catholic fullness that we see in the Eucharist. I was wondering, how does the true and living God then in the Eucharist form us to consume and be consumed rightly? Yeah, um, or can form us anyway. I mean, I, I've been criticized for, for being... Uh, uh, not realize, not not talking enough about the ways that the Eucharist can be distorted, uh, and it certainly can. Um, uh, when it's done right, I, I would want to say, then it does form us in positive ways. It can deform us, but it it can form us in positive ways. Uh, in this idea that, in some ways, the the act of consumption is turned inside out. So um, instead of just kind of taking something in the external world and sucking it into the self, which is the way we usually think about consumption, uh, St. Augustine talks about how, um, uh, you know, he hears the voice of God saying, um, eat of me, and instead of me being assimilated to your flesh like the food that you eat, uh, you will become assimilated to me. Right, and so it turns the act of consumption inside out. Kind of, we are we are consumed by God. Then that's the why the the book is called being consumed, um, because we're kind of drawn out of our small selves into this larger self of the church, the body of Christ, of God. Um, and so um, the the Eucharist, then the, the idea that we we eat the body of Christ and then become the body of Christ, is a way of kind of turning this whole. Um, uh, consumptive uh, mechanism on its uh, on its ear. Yep, wonderful. And um, I just want to close up by asking you about this most recent book. Would you like to tell us a bit more about that? And is there anything else that you still feel the passion to get involved with now or in the future? Um, oh gosh, yeah. Uh, th this book is kind of overdue. It's a it's a book on idolatry, and it's meant to be kind of a sequel to the myth of religious violence. So in the, in the myth of religious violence, the basic argument is, look, uh, there's no point to um, dividing up violence between religious violence and secular violence. These categories are basically contingent and arbitrary and people kill for all sorts of things. People kill for gods, they kill for oil, they kill for flags, they kill for nations, um, you know, they kill for free markets. The invisible hand of the market and and so on um and so uh, it's a way of trying to kind of level the playing field and in a way um that book was there's no theology explicit in the book um because it was aimed at a kind of secularist audience that that hears this myth that you know oh religion is this peculiar thing that causes violence um and, and that kind of gives a pass then to so-called secular kinds of violence um, there was no uh, explicit theology in that book. And so what I'm doing now is kind of writing a book that's more theological uh, because the implicit theology of that is idolatry, right? People worship all kinds of things. 
Um, you know, Paul says uh, uh, of the Philippians, their God is their bellies. Um, you know, Jesus says you can't worship God and money, God and mammon. Um, people, you know, worship all, all kinds of things. Um, and, uh, and, and we need to be uh, very uh, clear about that. And we're all idolaters, of course. Um, and so trying to kind of discern our way through that and, and trying to turn false worship into uh, true worship is um, that's what I'm, I'm kind of working on. In some ways, um, it's all encapsulated by that wonderful commencement address that uh, David Foster Wallace gave at Kenyon College in 2005, where he says, you know, in real life, there's no such thing as an atheist. Everybody worships. Uh, the only question is, what are you going to worship? And the reason for worshiping something like God, he says, is that anything else is going to eat you alive. So if you worship money, you'll never have enough. If you worship uh, your looks, you'll never look uh, good enough. You'll always be anxious. And, and he goes on like that. And so in some ways, this is an attempt to um, uh, spell that out in, um, in a detailed uh, way. Yeah, marvellous, and I look forward to it. I'm sure other people will enjoy that too. Thank you very much for joining me today, Bill. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Oh, thank you, Mark. This has been fun. God bless you. <laughs>